Welcome to today's top rated seller webinar. This is a free monthly webinar series for sellers of all sizes and types, not just for top rated sellers. I want to extend a special welcome to today's sponsors. They are eBay Radio, where you've got the griff. Billboards by PageMage, make your eBay listings stand out to sell out. Brand your listings, advertise special offers, cross sell items and more across all your listings. Billboards is one of the top 10 most popular applications in the eBay App Center and it's completely free. Stamps.com. If you're selling online through multiple sales channels, shipping can be a headache. Not with Stamps.com. Stamps.com consolidates all your orders so you can ship them out with ease. With one click, you can directly import all of your order data from the most popular online marketplaces, including eBay, Amazon, PayPal, and Etsy, plus the most popular shopping cart software. And outright, putting your accounting on Terapeak. Also, putting your accounting on autopilot and also Terapeak because Terapeak sellers make more money. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our upcoming webinar. Our next webinar is called Smart Sourcing, How to Source the Products that Buyers Went. This will be presented by Lisa Satora on Wednesday, April 25th, 2012. Your product line is the engine of your business. In this webinar, e-commerce strategist Lisa Satora will share five key product sourcing strategies for expanding your business on eBay. Learn how to tap into exactly what today's consumers want to buy and how to leverage multiple sourcing channels for product line expansion. Sign up now at topratedsellerwebinars.com. Be sure to stay connected with us and find out at the very first to know about all of our new upcoming webinars. Sign up on our blog at topratedsellerwebinars.com. Sign up to receive our newsletter. You can find that sign up form also on the blog. We also have a great Facebook group, very active. Look for us on Facebook as Top Rated Seller Webinars. Our presenter today is Russell Walraven, direct to us from Cabbage.com. Thanks, Russell. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks, Kat. I appreciate you guys having me. We are delighted to have you today and tell us all about working capital for our business and how to grow our businesses. Everybody's goal is to get bigger, and Russell, we're excited you're going to tell us how. Well, well great. I'm excited to share a little bit of information today, and, and it really couldn't come at a better time having uh, Lisa being your next webinar and talking about sourcing material, maybe this will give some people a little bit of information on how they can get some capital, how they can get some cash if they need it to go out and source um, with all of Lisa's great tips because she's very good at, at what she does and very good at giving information on, on how to source. So hopefully after today you'll know a little bit more about working capital, about how it can grow your business and uh, how you can use that for things like sourcing like Lisa will teach you how to do. Um, just want to give you a little rundown about what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with why is there a need for working capital? Um, what, is, what is the need out there in the, in the marketplace today? We'll talk a little bit about that, give you a little bit of information about that. We'll talk a little bit about personal credit versus business credit and which is the right to use, when you should use which one, and how you should use, um, how you should use each of those. Um, next, we want to talk a little bit about measurement, about how you should measure um, working capital, about what numbers you should be looking at um, when you when you use working capital, and what you maybe should not look at, what you what doesn't make sense, what type of numbers don't make sense. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you should use working capital, what you should use it for, and maybe a little bit more importantly, what you shouldn't use it for. And then we'll we'll kind of wrap up by by talking about how to know if you should be using working capital and how do you know if it's right for you. So that's kind of a rundown of what we'll talk about today. And without further ado, we'll kind of get started. And I want to introduce you guys um, to Bill. I know a lot of you guys maybe have met Bill before if you're familiar with Cabbage and you've, you've heard us talk. But Bill's an online seller and he sells liquidated sporting goods equipment, most um, uh, particularly golf equipment. Um, and right now with the Masters um, right around the corner, the Masters going on. Um, it, it's a good time for to talk about golf equipment, but Bill's been, been selling on eBay since 2002, and he's been doing a pretty good business. He sells about $164,000 a year over the last three years. He does a great job of customer service, as you can tell by his seller rating, uh, which is currently at 99.3%, and he has, a good, he has a good credit score. 
His credit score is 680, which is, which is a good credit score. Um, so you, he runs a good business. He, he does all the things he needs to do. And he just done an awesome deal on a lot of, of Titleist Scotty Cameron putters. For all of you guys that don't know, um, Scotty Cameron putter is a putter that Tiger Woods used when he first broke into the uh, professional golfing ranks. And it's a very good putter, and, and, and a lot of people want those. Um, some of them want it because Tiger used it. Some of them want it because it's a good putter. But there's one thing that Bill doesn't have that he needs for those putters in his cash. And it, it's not because Bill doesn't do do a lot of business, but maybe um, maybe he's um, in, in a part of his, his season, maybe since golf season has already started, he's not selling a lot and he doesn't have a lot of liquid funds. Or maybe it's because he's just getting ramped up in the season and, and all that cash flow is not, not coming in. So what he needs to buy this lot of putter is cash, and he just doesn't have it right now. So what does Bill do? He goes to his friend Rich. And Rich is a traditional lender. Rich grew up with Bill. They went to high school together. They played football together. Rich likes Bill a lot. Um, and and they're, they're friendly outside of, of work. Um, but the, the problem is Bill doesn't understand uh, Rich doesn't under, excuse me. Rich doesn't understand Bill's business. He can't see traffic in Bill's store because there's not a brick and mortar store there. He can't walk the aisles. He can't see all the golf balls on the shelves. He can't see all the putters and, and drivers and golf bags in the store um, because there's no online store. He, he can't talk to customers that are leaving leaving Bill's store and and find out what they think about him and how how he services his customers very well. And when he looks at when Rich looks at Bill, he sees one thing: a credit score. And, and while while Bill does have a good credit score of 680, everyone knows right now that, that banks aren't lending to, to folks um, with anything under 700, 720, and particularly when they can't see these things in the store, um, like Bill's store. They just, while he wants to work with Bill, and he likes Bill, and he understands uh, that Bill is in business, they're, they're, traditional lenders are not set up to work that way. They just, they just don't work that way, whether they want to or not, because they do rely heavily on that credit score. So really, Rich only sees part of the picture. He sees the credit score, but he doesn't see anything else. He doesn't see um, Bill's revenue. He doesn't see all of the things that make Bill's business very successful. So therefore, he can't help Bill as much as he'd like to. And what does that, what does that mean? There are a ton of Bills out there. There are a lot of people out there in Bill's situation. They're doing a great business. They've been in business a long time. Their seller rating is spectacular. Um, their credit score is good. Um, but, but regardless, if their credit score was 750, Rich still wouldn't be able to see all this other information. And whether they sell golf clubs or they sell auto parts or, or they sell um, collectibles, regardless of what they sell, folks like Rich can't understand them. And there are a lot of people out there in this situation. So th that just goes to show you how big the need is out there. There are a lot of people out there doing a lot of business, and they don't have access uh, to working capital. So, so what do people do when they don't have access to working capital? They don't have access to business credit. They start using personal credit. They start using their credit cards. And there was a report that came out. Um, uh, it's a couple years old now. It was, I think it was 2008. But what that report said was, if you start with a credit score of 750, and say you started a business and you open three personal credit cards um, to start funding that business, you open them either a Visa or a MasterCard or American Express, it's just a personal credit card that's tied to your personal credit and not to your business. If you open three credit cards and you max those out immediately, regardless of, of the limit, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, if you do nothing else other than open those cards and you, and you max them out to run your business, your credit score is going to drop like 100 points. So why is that significant? We'll get to that in a few minutes. But, but what, what people should understand is what are the differences between personal and business credit? And you see on here, you see a hammer, you see a nail, and you see, you see pliers, and you're thinking, what in the world does that mean? So let's, let's think a lot of you are in a situation that I'm in where you have children, or you, you have a free weekend and you want to build something, build a, a stand for your dog bowl or build a birdhouse since it is spring and the weather's so nice, and you have to hammer in a nail, or you have to nail in, you have to put a nail in the board. And what would be the best tool to use? It obviously would be a hammer. But let's say you don't have access to that hammer, so you grab your pliers. And you can bang that nail into the board with a pair of pliers, but once you need those pliers, 
most likely is they're going to be damaged. The same thing is true with your personal credit score when you use it for business. You use it for your business, and you could make all the payments. You could you could pay everything back, but just by using that, just by opening all those lines of credit, you're going to damage your personal credit. And sometime down the future, when maybe you need to, maybe you need to refinance your house, or maybe you need to buy a car, you're not going to be able to to borrow money um, at the terms you would like because you've damaged your personal credit because you've used it for your business. And another thing that that comes into play here is when you use your personal credit to fund your business, let's just, let's just say lightning strikes, and, and no one that is on the, this webinar series falls into this category, but let's say your business starts to fail, and you heavily leverage in your personal credit. You could potentially lose your house, you could potentially lose your car, you could lose a lot of your personal assets because your business failed. And we, um, we don't feel that that should be the case. Your business um, sh should, affect your personal life of course it should help you to get the things and get the places you want to be in your personal life but it shouldn't be something where if something happens and your business fails it shouldn't make you lose your house your car or things of that nature so let's talk a little bit about what what the difference between business and personal credit is personal credit is a statement of your ability to pay back a debt a personal ability to pay back a debt like we talked about there's something to purchase non-investment goods that depreciate quickly so, for example, a car. You go out and you buy a brand new 2012 Honda Accord. You pay $25,000 for that car. You get um, you get a loan for that. You pay it back over 60 months. Well, let's say in four years from now, you, you've made every payment on time. Um, you've done everything you're supposed to do. But you have a year left to pay on that car. And let's say you have $12,000 left, but the car is only worth about $8,000. So it is a non-investment good that depreciates quickly, and that is a form of, of a way to use personal credit. Business credit should be an investment. I'm going to use the word, the term working capital and business credit kind of synonymously for the next few minutes. So working capital should be a revenue generating asset. It should do exactly what it says. It should work for you and your business. It should, you should be able to put working capital towards your business and it should make money for you. It should be a revenue generating asset. And what business credit should not be, it should not be a cost center. It shouldn't be something that is not directly generating money for you. It should be, we're talking, again, we'll talk a little bit about this more in a minute, but it should not be something like rent. It should not be something like utilities that are more of a cost of doing business and not something that is generating cash for you. So, a couple of things you always hear about when you're starting, when you're talking about loans, you're talking about credit cards, is APR um, or annual percentage rate. What we're going to talk about here is what is the difference between APR and ROI and what you should be using those for and how you should be looking at business credit. So just a little background, APR is the total interest rate charged over the course of a year on a loan or a credit card. So one thing I'm going to kind of more new loan is credit cards most often report the nominal APR compounded monthly. So it may be a figure which is um, which is less than the actual annual rate. So just a little bit, uh, be a little bit careful when you see see an APR and it and it looks looks kind of low, especially on a credit card. And what nominal APR is? It's just a simple interest rate on a loan for a year, excluding any fees. There may be other fees with um, with credit cards or different forms of credit. So just, just be aware when you're looking at that. And again, it's most often used on credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, and everybody's familiar with that. And now I'm going to bring bring into the bring into the equation ROI. And what ROI it means return on investment, and it is a performance measure used to evaluate the efficiency on an investment. And it should be looked at more as an investment. You're paying money towards something, and the money you get back as a result should be higher. It is the return you're making on that investment. And the ROI analysis compares the magnitude of investment or the size of the investment gains directly with the magnitude of the cost. So the higher the ROI, the better it is for your business. And again, it's most often used in business to determine the success of the business cost. So what does this mean? When should we use APR versus ROI? And when you're talking about working capital, does calculating an APR make sense? So let's go back to Bill's opportunity. He had he had the opportunity to buy a lot of Scotty Cameron putters for a thousand dollars, and he knows for a fact 
he can sell them for two thousand. And he in fact does sell them for two thousand dollars. In in less than thirty days, he buys those, puts them on eBay, sells them for two thousand dollars. Let's do a little bit of a breakdown of the transaction fees. We're assuming he have he has a ten percent eBay fee. So of that two thousand dollars, he's paying two hundred dollars. Of that PayPal fee, of that two thousand dollars, he has a three percent PayPal fee or sixty dollars. The inventory costs him a thousand dollars. We already talked about that. And when and when he financed working capital, let's assume he financed that thousand dollars and he had a five percent fee for those thirty days, or a true fee of fifty dollars. That gives him a net revenue of six hundred and ninety dollars. So if you just look, if you look at the eBay fee and the PayPal fee and the inventory, those are fees that he's going to pay anyway, regardless of how he got the money to pay for those putters. He sells it on eBay. He's going to pay the eBay fee. He's going to pay the PayPal fee, and of course he had to pay for his inventory. So the only fee that he is incurring that's over and above his normal cost of doing business fees is that fee of working capital, which was fifty dollars. So the ROI on that financing fee is over a thousand percent. So just by financing that money, Bill has made six hundred and ninety dollars that he would not have made otherwise. And you can say, okay, he took out a loan or working capital or whatever you want to call it for that. Um, so he paid five percent for thirty days. Calculating APR on that would be roughly sixty percent, depending on if you calculate it by number of days, we'll say 60%, which is which is a pretty high APR. But no one's going after eBay, saying what is eBay? What's the APR of eBay? The APR of eBay, in this case, is 120%, which is twice as much as as financing the working capital. The A, the APR of PayPal would be astronomical. It would be over a thousand percent because that three percent fee. Is doing nothing but they're they're holding money and they're allowing you to transfer that money for a 24-hour period. So again, no one's going after PayPal saying what's the APR of PayPal because it just doesn't make sense. In a situation of business using business capital, calculating APR is not the way you should look at that. You should look at it based on R ROI. And ROI here is a thousand, one thousand three hundred eighty percent. And I don't think anyone would would really be concerned about having making a thousand percent on a fifty dollar fee. So in this case, and we believe that when looking at working capital, working at, at business credit, APR just doesn't make sense. You need to look at ROI because we're all in this money. So by looking at business credit in terms of ROI, you are understanding that business credit is an investment. It should be something that works for you to make money. So, what are some things that we shouldn't be using business credit for? We talked about don't. We talked about earlier. Don't use them as a cost. What do we mean by that? Don't use them for rent. Don't use them for depreciating equipment, such as such as we talked about in the, in the example of using business credit to buy a car. Um, equipment that depreciates quickly is not something that working capital should be used for. Again, it shouldn't be used for personal reasons. You shouldn't take out a business line of credit and then use it for personal reasons because it is not working for you. It is not making money. And again, don't pay utilities or other bills with with working capital because again, those are costs of doing business. They're not things that are going to make money for you. Um, on the other hand, what should you use business credit or working capital for? The, the example of bill is a good example. Increased inventory. Another great example is using working capital to get better terms on your current inventory. At Cabbage, we have a customer who sells Latin products, sells products that he buys from different places, and sells sells online on eBay, on Amazon, on a lot of different um, a lot of different sites, and he buys mocajetes or mortar and pestles that people use to make guacamole. He buys them typically for ten dollars a piece, and he turns around and he sells them for thirty or forty dollars. What he did, he took out a line of working capital. Of about twenty thousand dollars, and that enabled him to go to his supplier and say, "I'm going to buy these from you, but I'm only going to pay you six dollars a piece for them." Um, just by, by having working capital in his account, just by having that security blanket of that cash available to him, he was able to negotiate better terms on the inventory that he was currently buying, and in turn made more money as a result because he was paying six dollars for those as opposed to ten dollars, still selling them for thirty to, to forty dollars. And making a substantial amount more money. Marketing your store. 
Um, a lot of people know that you can you can buy things such as Google AdWords. You can market your store. You can pay a hundred dollars for Google AdWords. That turns into two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, sometimes a thousand dollars in sales. So marketing your store um, when you market it correctly is a good use for working capital. Or building or improving your website. I know a lot of folks that sell on eBay and Amazon. Improving your website is also a great use um, of business credit for working capital. And, and the final thing we want to talk a little bit about is, should I use business credit? And the answer to that question is, uh, it, it's different for everyone. You have to know your business in order to know if it makes sense for you. The first thing we're going to tell you is, if it doesn't make sense from a cost standpoint for your business, don't use it. And how do you know if it's, it's works from a cost standpoint? You have to know your business inside and out. The CEO of Cabbage always tells us internally, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And, and that's totally true. That's totally true in all business. You have to be able to measure the effects of things that you do in order to manage their effectiveness. And then always use the lowest cost financing options available to you. Maybe it is a, a business credit card from, from a credit card company. Maybe it's uh, a line of, of credit from your bank, maybe it's a, a line of working capital from somewhere like a cabbage. But whatever is the lowest option for you, you should use. And don't limit yourself to one. Don't pit them one versus the other. I can only use this or I can only use that. Use all of your options and use the lowest cost financing options available to you. The biggest thing that, that I said here was you have to know your business. You have to be able to measure and manage everything you do in your business. Um, and there are some great tools out there that can help you do that. Outright, one of the sponsors of, the, of this webinar series, is a, is a great tool for businesses. It helps you um, absolutely understand everything you're doing from a number standpoint in your business. Also a great thing to do is attend events where experts speak, experts speak on this topic of understanding your business. eBay on Location is coming up. Go to eBay on Location um, and, and hopefully Griff will be there speaking again because Griff does an outstanding presentation he calls Know Your Numbers. And I'm sure you can go out there and you can search online and you can find uh, copies of that presentation, but listen to Griff's presentation because it's the best one I've heard on how to understand your business and how to know your numbers. And then lastly, once you understand everything, once you think, okay, should I be using working capital? First, find ways to save money in your business. Maybe find a cheaper shipping option. Maybe go to a, someone like a Bubble Fast and get discounted packaging materials. But just anything you can do to find business or to save money is going to free up capital, free up cash for you to help run your business and give you the opportunity to have more cash available to do the things you need to grow. So that's kind of all the information that that we uh, that we have put together that we think is important. And and I would love to. I know Cat has a couple of questions that. Um, that you'd like to ask, and I'd love to try to try to help and answer those questions. Russell, thanks. That was a really good presentation. Really helped me understand what to use cabbage on and what not to use my working capital on. Um, what to not use it on items that depreciate, but to use it on items that are going to return on my investment. So that was really cool. I love the uh, plier analogy about business credit and personal credit. So are there any benefits at all to using personal credit or am I risking my credit score and everything else by trying that? Well, uh, first of all, I will say there's probably not a business out there that started regardless of what, what market you're in that hasn't used some form of personal credit to get started. So don't feel like if you've done that or if you're doing that currently that you're, you're going to screw everything up, you're going to fail because everyone does it. But it does affect your credit score. Um, and by affecting your credit score and affecting your personal credit on things that, that are business related, once you do grow and once you go out looking for more lines of credit, there is the potential there that you're not going to be able to get it because your personal credit score has been affected regardless of if you're paying things off correctly, regardless of if you're doing a great business, just by opening personal lines of credit and maxing them out or having carrying a high balance on those, it's going to drop your personal credit score probably by 100, 100 points or so. Wow. By, by doing that, 
you're going to, to affect your personal life as well as your business when you either try to get lines of credit for, for maybe you're adding onto your house. Mm-hmm. Or like I said, maybe you're buying a car. Um, and then also, once you do grow, and once you go to a traditional lender and they can see all of your information and you potentially can can get capital from a traditional lender, they're still going to look at your personal credit. Right. So if, you, if you used all of that personal credit and you've lowered your score, you're going to be negatively affected by that in the future. Well, that 100 points is really scary because um, people don't realize that they say, well, you know, I don't need, I've already got my house, I've already got my car, I don't really need a great credit score. But what you don't understand is that your credit score costs you in so many, many ways. In fact, uh, the car insurance that you purchase, your life insurance policies, your health insurance, if you buy that yourself, all of those policies are affected by your credit rating. So you could be significantly raising your monthly um expenses in some ways by having a lower credit rating. Isn't that right, Russell? That, that's absolutely right. I didn't mention any of those things that you just mentioned, and it, it's outstanding that you did. I mean, just just think, car insurance is expensive enough as it is, and now when they're starting to look at your credit score um, to, to determine your interest rate, or excuse me, your insurance rate, your monthly premium on your car insurance, your monthly bills could increase by, by a lot. Yeah. And that could, again, especially a lot of these these single owner businesses that that are selling on eBay and are doing a lot of business on eBay, it's going to affect how much inventory they can buy, how much marketing they can do, just because they're having to pay more on all of these different uh, monthly costs. Absolutely. It's really shocking to me how widespread it's become to pull a person's credit rating for anything, from renting an apartment to buying a car to you know anything that you're looking at. So um, good, good reasons for keeping your personal credit and your business credit separate. Now, um, talking about business credit, how do I establish business credit? Say I'm a solopreneur, just me, doing my cat's closet business, and I file as a Schedule C sole proprietorship. How do I start developing business credit? I think I think Cabbage is really the only place that, that allowed me to start without an EIN number and an LLC and everything else. But how would I start establishing my business credit? Yeah, well, I mean, th- th- things like Cabbage is, is, is a good place to start. Um, you, you can always go um, go to your traditional lenders and give it a shot. I don't think it's probably going to work. Or, or you could, could start using, there are some, some companies that offer business credit cards. Um, and you can try there. But again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tied somewhat to your personal credit. You're going to be required to give your Social Security number um, and do that sort of thing. So uh, it, it, it's just go, go to a place like Cabbage. Just get started. I mean, the, the best thing to do is just get started um, growing your business credit and trying to separate your business and personal credit. Um, the, and and the, it's just like anything else. The hardest step's the first one. Mm-hmm. So once you, once you get there and you start doing it and you start growing, and your business starts growing, um, as your business grows, you're going to begin to be noticed more by traditional lenders, um, by, by different different types of people. And as that happens, then you're going to be able to establish more of a business credit. Um, I will tell you that, that a Cabbage, for example, Cabbage doesn't report to any of the, of the credit bureaus. So we're not going to affect your personal credit anymore. Okay, so you're not reporting, and that's not going to affect my credit report, but am I building credit, uh, business credit with, through you? Because I will say that, you know, you can grow a long way with Cabbage. I believe my very first Cabbage loan was $100. I mean, I don't even know if you guys go that low anymore, but I think it was $100 I started with. And now, you know, I've worked my way up by, by repaying the loans and using them to invest in higher inventory. I get, you know, thousands now. But you guys go up to, what, forty or $20,000 now, up to that amount? We, we currently go up to 40. We're testing uh, a couple of folks up to 100,000. So wow. So wouldn't be surprised if it, if it increases to 100 over the next few months. But, but you're absolutely right, Kat. With, with Cabbage, you, you start at a certain level, um, and as you, make, as you make payments, as you continue to, to take money and pay it back and use it to grow your business, and as your business grows, um, we, we, we do increase lines. So... That you are building business credit with Cabbage, um, for example, as you as you as you take money and as you pay it back and as you grow your business. And I do want to encourage folks. Um, one of the reasons I started out so low is my my personal history. We 
my husband and I got caught in the uh, housing market collapse, and so we lost a home. So, of course, that affected our credit seriously. So if you're out there and you've got something like that on your record or you've got not a 680 credit report, credit score, don't think that Cabbage is going to turn you down. Uh, as your mother always told you, it never hurts to ask, and I have found the people at Cabbage very, very willing to work with you. Um, show them your sales history on eBay and Amazon and Etsy and your you know Yahoo stores and all the other places that they connect with, and you know they'll work with you uh, and not look at just your credit score. So I want to encourage folks who think they don't have perfect credit, they don't qualify, not to give that up. Now to get back a little bit to the education part about you know how to use the business credit, how not to. You talked in one slide about using um, the business credit to. Uh, to grow your business and through sourcing particularly. Then you talked a little bit about marketing. And then you talked and a little bit later about one of the things you can do to, to learn about how to, how to use business credit is to attend events. So we're right in the beginning of the event season. We've got eBay on location coming up. We've got the eBay radio party coming up. We've got the Kansas Jubilee in a few months. Are those kind of events where you're going to get networking and education something that you would use business credit for? Or would you say that that needs to come from the cash flow from your business, not more of an investment? You know, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's definitely education is something that, that you can use working capital for. Because as you go to these events, and as you know, Cap, because you attend all of them, you presented all of them, when you get that information to to use on your personal business on your own business and you bring that back it can increase your sales it can increase your growth sometimes exponentially so working capital is a good use a good thing to use for going to these events and getting um, educated on on how to do better in your business we we would definitely um, support that and there have been folks um, from, from cabbage a, a lot of you folks know um, no posty he sells, yes. He sells things on uh, on eBay like keyboards and and lots of things like that. He took cash um, last year to go to the eBay radio party, mm -hmm. and as a result, he he sent us multiple notes saying I used this tactic that I learned and it generated this much revenue, mm -hmm. and I did this and it's turned into this. So that's a, a real life example of how someone has used money to go to one of these events, and it's. Um, and has benefited his business. And I will tell you, I mean, there, there are two things that I would look for when I'm going, going to these events. I would look at, are there other sellers going to present? People like Kat, people um, like Lynn Drolly, people um, like John Lawson, are people that are presenting, are they people that have done this? Are these people that sell stuff on eBay that I could get good information for? And if ever, if Griff is going to be there doing his Know Your Numbers, it's definitely worth it because you will you will get a much better understanding of your business after going through Griff's presentation and applying some of that to your own business than you ever thought you would. Absolutely. And we at Top Rated Seller Webinars were very blessed to have Griff do one of his Know Your Numbers presentations right here on one of our webinars. Um, Russell, so you can actually, those who are listening, you can look on our YouTube channel and you can actually watch a video of Griff's webinar, Know Your Numbers. Also, Chris Taylor, one of our sponsors, PageMage.com, uh, he put together a a guide from Griff's Know Your Numbers, and that's available on the PageMage.com uh, website under their educational tools. Um, so you can definitely educate yourself that way. That's great. What about education? I know that there are membership sites online. Um, Janelle Elms OSI Rockstars is one I belong to. There are other places. Uh, Lynn Drolly has a Queen's Court. Would that be something worthwhile investing money in education? And would that be something that you would use cabbage or, or, or business capital for? Or would you use that as build that into your monthly cash flow of your business? You, you know, if it's, if it's more of a monthly subscription type, Type of thing, I think that might be more of a, a cash flow situation. Okay. Um, but 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 in general, I would say education is, is something that you are using to grow your business. Okay. Um, so so it would be uh, something working capital could be used for. Um, and and folks like Janelle um, that have have great following and have great information is good. Uh, Lynn, you mentioned Lynn in the Queens Court. Um, it. it any of that stuff, anything that you can do to grow your business, 
we are very supportive of the cat. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, and basically, a lot of the, you know, we talked about a lot of different options, and I think it, there's some it depends in there, and I, I get I get uh, colored as the depends lady because I, I tend to work it depends into every answer. But uh, there are situations where it would make sense to, to use uh, business capital for all of these things, and other situations where it really is something you should be budgeting for each month and saving, you know, the, uh, the education services, the events, uh, co upgrading the computer equipment which maybe help you work faster, but also, you know, a cash flow issue. But basically, I think one of the main reasons and one of the main uh, purposes of working capital, like you said, is the uh, acquisition of inventory. And I want to remind folks that uh, you talked in one of, your, one of your examples about your customer who sells the Latino products and how he was able to get better terms. That happens a lot with folks that are sourcing um, large deals or uh, liquidation type items. I had a friend report to me, Danny, I believe you know from the Danny app, that she was out uh, sourcing and was offered a fantastic deal. And she was not near a computer, couldn't get into her Cabbage account. So she actually called customer service at Cabbage and said, hey, I have this deal. Can you put this money in my PayPal account? And y'all within two minutes had the money into her PayPal account. She was able to close the deal and make the purchase of her items. So um, it's a great use of your business capital. And for those of you thinking about uh, signing up with Cabbage, it is uh, very convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, 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 is a, that is a true story. And, and it's funny because Danny actually called me. Oh, did she? Okay. Yeah, it was funny. She, she called me and, and said, I don't, I don't know if I can do this through my phone and I, I, I need this cash. What, what can we do? And, and just like you said, I mean, we call customer service. They said, how much do you need? Yep. Danny said, I'll call you back when I find out. <laughs> and, uh, we, we got her the money, and, and she, she, she made, the, made the purchase. And, yep. and I, I, I'm interested to hear. It, it, it's just been a couple of weeks, so... I'm interested to hear how much money she made off that. Well, she's just getting the item started. As I recall, she was actually at the ASD trade show, and she actually bought an entire booth of items. So, uh, yeah, so it sounds like a really good deal. But that's one of the opportunities when you know you have that cash. So even if you're not sure that, I mean, you have enough business capital in your account that, to cover you, you're good. It never hurts to have that backup ace in the hole for when these deals come along. I was able to uh, purchase one of my wholesalers ran a, they were discontinuing some styles. And so they were selling a whole bunch of items at 60% off the wholesale price. So um, I swooped in with my business capital uh, from Cabbage and took advantage of that 60% off sale and made some really good profits. So um, it's nice to have that ace in the hole. Um, Russell, if I'm unsure and I really don't want to go into debt, but I, I think maybe there might be some deals in the future, does it make sense for me to go to Cabbage and open up an account just so that I have access to that? It, it, it absolutely does. Um, we, we do not charge anything until you actually take money. So you can come in today you can fill out the application in less than 10 minutes, uh, find out what you have available to you, and it, it essentially is just there. It, it's, it's there for you when you need it, um, if you need it, and um, if you do use it, you, you, will be, you will be charged a fee, but if you don't, it's just like you said, it's a security blanket. It's, a, it's something where if, if an opportunity arises that, that was unforeseen or it's just too good to pass up, then you can go to your computer, you can go to your iPad, you can have the money sent directly to your PayPal account, or you can give us a call and we'll, we'll do it for you. And um, it, uh, it's something that, that, like I said, takes less than 10 minutes to do, and it gives you a little bit of a, a security blanket if, if and when you ever need it. And I, I just love that idea because it really, sometimes small businesses, what we lack, especially the tiny ones, the solopreneurs, micro businesses, what we lack is negotiating power, folks. And you, you all know that because we're looking at these wholesalers and we're looking at a $500 opening, a, opening uh, order and we're thinking that's a lot of money to invest in one product. So negotiating power of being able to place a larger order is what cabbage and business capital can put in your hands. So let's wrap it up and circle around to the very beginning. There is a difference between business credit and personal credit, and you've got to know when to use each. When you are looking at business credit or working capital, you want to make sure you're using them, help me through this, Russell, on something that's going to return an investment, correct? That's right. You want, you want to look at, at working capital as an investment. 
you want it to be a revenue generating asset. So just, just like the term says, you want it to be a form of capital that works for you. You, you use this, it's going to give you back more than you initially put out. So it, it, that's the simple way to look at it. If it's going to be something where I, I, pay, I pay for this with, with working capital, the return I get from that is going to be more than I paid. Awesome. Great wrap up. Okay. Well, Russell, really appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll get this recording up to the YouTube channel as soon as we can so our folks can hear it. Great. All right.